So today's lineup for the Yankees against the Tampa Bay Rays is out. And guess what we're back to this date in Yankees history as well. Let's talk about it right now. Hey, gang, hope you're all doing well. So we got Carlos Rodon on the stump today, okay? And I have the Yankees lineup for you. And this, But there's a couple of things to kind of tie in here. You know, I was talking to Scott Braun yesterday and Mickey Mazin and a fee um, about what's going on and with Scott Boras clients and blah, blah, blah. Well, I mean, you know, getting a resurgent season from Carlos Rodon and, you know, a little bit more health and progression from uh, Nestor Cortez and the next step in the development from Clark Schmidt lessens the need to sign somebody like Blake Snell or Jordan Montgomery. Because you're going to have to pay double for both of them anyway, or either one of them anyway. So, and are you really going to get that much more production for that much money? I don't know. I really don't know. Could they get the same or, you know, similar production to, in trading for Shane Bieber? Yeah. Is the price for trading for Dylan Cease insane? Yeah. But with that said, something to keep in mind because the, 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 the biggest uh, Scott Boris client next year is Juan Soto. The other second biggest is Corbin Burns and the Yankee fans, a lot of Yankee fans want both of them. So I don't see that happening, but <clears throat> yeah, because Juan Soto is priority number one. But with that said, the ask is going to be crazy high. Okay. And now that Shohei Otani's gotten $700 million deal, Scott Boris is likely going to ask for that. We've got some disagreements here. Um, you know, folks talking about perceived value of this and blah, blah. It's really not. It's seven hundred million, no matter what anybody says. It's guaranteed, whether it's over ten years or twenty years, doesn't matter what the value is. He's going to make every dime of the seven hundred million. Yes, it's structured in a way that benefits him and not the team because he's making two million a year for the next ten years while he's playing, and then sixty-eight million a year while he's not playing. It's designed that way. He's going to make $40, 50000000 million a year anyway in endorsements the next 10 years when he's playing, but he's going to be taxed on the $2 million. Whereas after that, when he's likely retired, he can go back to Japan. He won't be working in the state of California anymore, so he won't be subject to that taxation. So the value of it is going to be even higher. It's not going to be $400 something million. Okay? It's not. So it's a good deal for Shohei Otani. Okay, and it's an investment type deal for the Dodgers. And this is a lot of re one reason why a lot of Yankee fans want a deferred contract for Soto. I can't see that happening, but you know, this is a net benefit for Shohei Otani. But there's a couple things to keep in mind. Okay. He's gonna make every dime of the seven hundred million dollars he's getting paid. Every dime. Okay. Doesn't matter the perceived value of it. Now, with that said, <clears throat> whatever Soto makes, he's likely gonna make <clears throat> that in a in the period of time to where he's contracted, just like Yoshinobu Yamamoto, he's going to get paid within the next, whatever, I don't remember, 12 years. So he's going to make in the same 12 to 15 years, he'll make all that money in that time frame while he's here. Now, with that said, I wanted to make that clear because there seems to be some confusion as to that type of stuff. So, um, you know, I want I wanted to clear that up, but hopefully you found, hopefully, you, know, you found that a little bit more informative and helpful, but that's, you know, that's the way that the tax system is designed right now. People like Shoyo Tiny, the super rich, to take advantage of those loopholes where the regular people don't really have the opportunity or luxury to do that. But it is what it is, right? So let's get to the lineup, okay? Make sure, by the way, if you're not subbed to this channel, hit that sub button, okay? You enjoy consistent Yankee content. <clears throat> you want to be kept in the loop on everything that happens, whether it's Yankees or all the guys that are still not signed. Please do that. And hit the like button if you enjoy the content. Hit the notification button to put you at the front of the line when everything comes in. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for both. Now, here's the lineup. This is looking a little bit more, a little, little, very couple of days. You, you know, you get a better idea of what the Yankees' opening day lineup might start to look like. Well, DJ, we've talked about him leading off. We talked about him potentially platooning against lefties as a leadoff. Alex Verdugo against righties, we'll see. But Verdugo's back in the lineup too, so that's a good sign. But DJ Lemayo's leading off. Third base, Juan Soto batting second in right field. Aaron Judge batting third in center field. I would imagine this is what the top three, or to some degree, is going to look like. Anthony Rizzo is batting cleanup at first base. Glaber Torres is batting fifth at second base. I could flip either one. Torres fourth, Rizzo fifth. 
I'm fine with either one. Giancarlo Santos batting sixth at the DH spot, I think, is a good spot for him. Alex Verdugo batting seventh in <clears throat> left field. Luis Torrens at the dish, batting eighth. Oswald Peraza, it's good to see him back in there, too, batting ninth at shortstop, okay, where he's one of the strongest defensive players that the Yankees have in the whole entire system or the majors. And on the mound, on the stump, toe in the slab, Carlos Rodon. Okay, that's the lineup against Tampa Rays. The Yankees are at Steinbrenner Field. They play a 105 game today. Okay, and I said this too. Like, I think if if Verdugo leads off, then DJ bats seven. If DJ bats lead off, then Verdugo bats seven. It's kind of the best way to lay out the lineup. But at some point, I would have Anthony Volpe, who's sitting today, at likely at eighth, and then whoever's catching at ninth. And then, then you have all the guys, whether it's Verdugo after that or whether it's DJ after that, and then Soto and Judge, you have a lot of guys to back up these players no matter where they're in the lineup. This lineup is so much deeper, so much deeper than it was before, So, which is exciting. But it's good to see Verdugo back in there. He had a leg contusion after being hit by pitch, so um, it's good to see him back. I really do, and I hope that he continues to produce and put himself in a position to do that. But as you haven't heard, the Yankees optioned out a couple of players last night. Spencer Jones was one of them. Back to minor league camp. Don't want to get these guys settled in their in their teams so that they can start getting regular regular playing time as well um, and continue their development so that they can position themselves to be on the major league team at some point. If anybody's close to the major league team, Spencer Jones has shown that. He's their number one prospect for a reason. Now, let's talk about the other topic of the day. This date in Yankees history, baby. <laughs> so, uh, this date in 2005, Susan Waldman becomes the first woman to be a full-time color commentator in Major League Baseball history. She's the OG in, in, in color commentators for females. The OG. We have her here in the Yankees land. Okay? Um, making her debut with John Sterling and on WCBS AM 880. That was the audio flagship of the Yankees as well, and it still is. So, Susan Waldman, the OG, he's this day in Yankees history today, March 5th, 2005, 19 years ago. Okay, now you've got Meredith Morakovitz in there. You've got them teaming up with a lot of other great folks too. So, she's bringing her contributions and her knowledge to Yankee land. She knows her stuff. She really, really does. And she's not afraid to voice her opinions too. So, <clears throat> we're lucky to have her. We're lucky to have Meredith too. Great minds, just great Yankee people. But that's what I have for you right now. Okay, stay tuned. There's still a lot of guys that haven't signed yet. They need to be signed. Okay, I'm looking to see if Scott Boris is going to try to take advantage of the Boston Red Sox having an injury with Lucas Giolito potentially missing the whole year as to try to get them to desperately overpay for Blake Snell and Jordan Montgomery because he's already made us think about the disconnect between teams' revenues and team spending, okay? Basically saying, why are you guys not overpaying for my clients? Why not? Even though my prices are higher, way higher than everybody else. You had two chances with the Yankees already, okay? You did Blake Snell a disservice. You did your boy dirty, right? And it is what it is. And Jordan Montgomery has already voiced frustration as to not being, why he's not signed. So um, we'll see what happens there one way or the other. But again, He's got a lot of the big dogs next year, too, so we're going to have to repeat this process with Scott Boris no matter what. So, But a lot of owners and GMs and teams are onto this guy now. Okay, they don't Just because he wants them to overpay doesn't mean they have to. You can cry collusion all you want. Doesn't matter. Okay, Doesn't mean they have to overpay what you're trying to sell. Okay, Period. So that's what I got for you. See you after the game. Peace. <laughs>